series this morning entitled More Than a Song. More Than a Song. And I like to call today's message After the Music Stops. After the Music Stops. While you're standing, grab your Bible, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, beginning at verse 8. When you have it, say, I've got it. it. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. And the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. You may be seated. I want to speak to you today again from the subject after the music stops. This message is centered around worship and what worship is really all about. I ask you to bow your heads with me as we begin to pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for just who you are. We thank you, God, that you are beyond our comprehension. You're beyond our ability, our ability to fully understand. We can't fully define you. Lord, you are too big. You are too great. You're too vast. You're too wide. There's too much of you to be contained in the human vocabulary. And God, we just thank you for teaching us, Lord, by your word, how to worship. We thank you for opening our understanding as we go through this series. We thank you for blessing our hearts. That we be able to take you in in a greater way. Have your way today and in every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Say amen again. Amen. Amen. History on the net records that it's estimated that approximately 15 million soldiers died in battle during World War II. 15 million soldiers died in battle during World War II. Military deaths, which include soldiers missing in action as well as fatalities due to disease, Accidents and prisoners of war deaths, along with battle deaths, are estimated to be between 22 and 30 million. This war is regarded as the deadliest in history, having wiped out about 3% of the world's population at the time. 3% of the world's population at the time. Whether right or wrong, every one of these individuals who died were committed to their cause to such a degree 
that they were literally willing to pay the ultimate price of giving their lives for what they believed in. The greed with where they stood or disagree, that's not my point. Here's my point. Being a worshiper, according to the Bible, more closely resembles being a soldier than it does being a singer. Yet in postmodern Christianity, worshiping God has come to be known as the latter more than the former. But the truth is, true worship, true worship, as it is explained in Scripture, true worship costs us more than a vibrato and a crescendo. True worship costs us everything. It costs us everything in like manner that World War II costs those soldiers everything. Let's look at this. Because it's so important to understand what worship is. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10. Again, the Bible says that the devil took Jesus on a very high mountain showed him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan for it is written. You shall worship the Lord, your God and serve him only. According to Strong's. The word used for worship in Matthew chapter four, verses nine and ten Is proskuneo, proskuneo. It means to prostrate oneself. To prostrate oneself in a literal or figurative sense as an act of homage. It's done to show reverence, respect, or adoration for the individual that you lay prostrate before. To prostrate is to lay oneself flat on the ground, face downward, especially in reverence or submission. Notice in that definition that it did not say sing a song. The idea behind worship is absolute surrender or complete and total submission to that which you lay prostrate before. So in biblical times, it was customary to lay oneself prostrate before dignitaries or objects of worship like idols or statues that they esteemed. And the message that you were sending by falling prostrate was that your life, your heart, your will, your mind, your desires were being offered in submission to whatever it is you were worshiping. Whatever it is you laid before, whatever it is you bowed under, it was symbolic that your life was surrendered completely and fully to that thing. See, true biblical worship is so much more than a song. It can be exemplified to a certain extent through song. But the song in itself is not what denotes worship. See, I can, as I sing, lay my heart 
and my will prostrate before God as an act of worship. But it's the condition of my heart and the life decision that I've made that makes it an act of worship more than it is the movement of my lips in synchronization with the lyrics. But today we have defined worship as a genre of music, haven't we? We've defined it as a genre of music. We've defined it as a certain tempo used in a musical composition. You know, the worship songs are the slow ones. We've understood it as the really slow songs with beautiful, thought-provoking lyrics. But none of these in and of themselves capture the epitome of what worship truly is according to Scripture. And I know it's confusing because we hear things like play some worship music or uh, you go to the Christian bookstore and you buy the latest quote unquote worship CD and you begin to think, oh, worship is a type of song. But worship is more than a song. It can be exemplified with song. It can be accompanied by music as an act of worship. But the song nor the singing in and of themselves were never worshipped. True worship is exemplified in the absence of the accompaniment of music. It happens before the music begins and it carries on even when the music stops. We have to remember that they didn't have Bose speakers back in Jesus' day. They didn't have CDs and mp3 players and streaming videos they didn't have that they didn't have 15 inch subwoofers in biblical times and worship was still done throughout the bible and it was done more often without the accompaniment of music than it was with it in scripture And even later in church history, you have men like John Calvin, John Wesley, and Charles Spurgeon who were opposed to the use of musical instruments at all in the singing of songs and hymns. Because worship was never about a type of music. I think it's a bit far to say that we're not going to use any instrumentality at all as we lift up our voices to the Lord. I think that's a bit much. But it is, however, important for us to separate true biblical worship from music, from singing, and from the instruments in and of themselves. The music is not worship. Worship is what we do, not what the music does. It's not music. It's not a type of music. It's not genre. It's not a song. It's none of that. Let's see if I can help us to understand a little bit more. You see, true worship is a lifestyle. Amen. Amen. Worship is the way in which we live our lives. It affects every part of our lives, how we see it, what we do with it, how we spend it, the direction we go, the things we abstain from, the things that we Hold to and draw near. The word worship comes from the old English worthship. Do you hear it? Worthship. The word was used as an acknowledgement of worth or the worthiness of the person being honored or respected. 
See, true worship encompasses all that is said, all that is done in obedience to God's word to show the worth of God. It's all that is said, it's all that is done in obedience to God's word to show the worth of God, to show how valuable he is to you. All of that is worth ship. All that is done according to scripture, and I need to, I need to emphasize that, all that is done according to scripture because there is a false worship. And we'll get into that later in the series. But all that is done according to scripture, all that is done in line with what God has expected, what God has revealed that he wants, all that lines up with the word of God and what he shows us he wants in scripture that shows God's priceless value to who we are, the redeemed, is an act of worship. It's more than a song. John chapter 4, verse 37, Peter said to him, I, lay, I will lay down my life for you. That's worship. I will lay down my life for you. That's a declaration that you are so worthy. You are so worth it. You are so valuable that I will lay my life down for you. That's worship. See, true worship is not just seen in a song. It's not just in lip service. It's seen in a life laid prostrate before Christ, surrendered completely, fully, 100% to his will as God the King. That's when we worship. That's when we declare, God, you are so worthy that I've surrendered and prostrate my life before you. Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, Peter also said, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. That's worship. You're so worthy that we have left everything everything behind that's your worth anytime we declare that God is so worth it that we move in his direction those are acts of worship you see these were worshipers Peter was a worshiper Worshippers declaring his absolute worthiness, worthy enough to leave everything and follow him. Worship is dropping everything to follow him. It's leaving all else behind if that's what it, it calls for. It is going on the straight and narrow and forsaking the broad path. It is picking up your cross and following him that 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 is that is worship anything and everything in the way being forsaken all hindrances laying aside every weight setting aside sin these all declare his worth these are all acts of worship worship places him above all else in our life Again, isn't this what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when he said to the crowd, if any one of you wants to be my follower, if you, if, if you want to be a worshiper, give up your own, take up your cross daily and follow me. Jesus said, I'm looking for soldiers and servants more than I'm looking for singers. We have a lot of people singing in church today, but God is looking for soldiers. He's looking for people who are willing to worship in a biblical sense, worship him, put him above all else in their life and go 100% in his direction in acknowledgement of his absolute glorious worthiness. 
That is the epitome of true worship right there, forsaking all to follow Jesus. The worth of Christ is no more profoundly stated than in laying our personal agendas at his feet as we daily surrender to his will. Again, true worship is happening before the music begins. And it continues after the music stops. So worship is not a one-time act. It's not a performance. It's not in a deed. It's not just in a song or in a series of songs. It is a consistent way of doing things, a consistent way of living your life. It's a manner in which your life is lived. It's an attitude towards the true God and a biblical perspective and outlook on the world, which leads you to accepting his lordship and rejecting the world. In worship, we say, God, you are absolutely worth it. You're worthy of all that I could do in obedience to you. It's worship. It's less that it's less that Christians worship and it's more that true Christians are worshipers. It's less that Christians worship and it's more that true Christians are worshipers. See, more worship is more than what we do occasionally. Amen. It's more than what we do occasionally on Sunday mornings. It's, it's who we are Monday through, fr- through Sunday, 365 days of the year. Our lives are lived to the glory of his name. We are worshipers more than it's something that we do every now and then. Amen. Our life is lived in worship. When it's sunny, when it's rainy, when times are good, when times are bad, our entire life, our entire being is aimed and committed at proclaiming the worthiness of our God. We are worshipers. Our entire life and the way that we live it should be an act of worship. Everything we say and do should reflect our commitment to submit to the true king, his infallible word, all of his commandments, all of his expectations. All of this boldly states to all around us that he is worthy and that we have laid our lives prostrate before him as God. When others wonder, why do you do all of that? Why, why do you give so much? Why do you spend so much time there? Why do you give up so much? Why, why do you give up so many things? Why, why have you stopped doing whatever? Why did you turn from that? The answer is simple. Because we are worshipers. We worship God. We don't just turn to him every now and then when we need him. We worship him. Our whole life is aimed at at surrendering, submitting to him as being this worthy being to whom we owe everything who created us all, who gave us all that we have. We worship him. And true worship of God thrusts you away from the superficial, personalized, make-up God who I want him to be, tailor him to fit him to the life style that I live, It thrusts you away from that. True worship thrusts you away from the superficial Christianity that sits on the outskirts. True worship digs deep 
and is serious and is committed. We worship him for who he is and who he's revealed himself to be in scripture. We worship God. That means we've laid our life at his feet under his will in one long, continuous, perpetual act of honor and respect for the king of glory who loves us, who gave his son to die for us, who redeemed us, who rescued us, who is going to return to take us with him. We worship this God. All of the following are examples of how we are worshipers. When we serve him, we worship him. When we praise him, we worship him. When we witness to others, we are worshiping him. When we give, we worship. When we give our time, we are worshiping. When we turn from our sins, we're worshiping. When we reject the world, we worship him. When we obey him and his word, we are worshiping him as God. He's saying all of these other things are less worthy than you. It's so much more than a song. Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. We read of a man named Abraham. Abraham was a worshiper, not because he walked around singing wow music. He wasn't a worshiper because he turned on his CD player in the car. But he was a worshiper. Look what Abraham says in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. For those of you that know the story, this is when God tested Abraham. He tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac. If you know the story, you know that Abraham waited 25 years for this son. 25 years. And he was finally here. He finally had him. Abraham was over 100 years old when he finally had this son of promise. And now all of a sudden, God is testing him. And says, I want you to give him to me. We know the story. Abraham rose early in the morning. You know, if you get up early, you're serious about it. Most of us would have laid in that bed and just toss and turn for a little bit. And then maybe when the sun started dipping... But Abraham got up early because he was a worshiper. He understood the worthiness of God. He knew, Hebrews says, that even if God took him, he could give him back again. He he knew how worthy God was of this sacrifice. He got up early. He took everything he needed. He didn't miss a step. He moved in God's direction to obey. He willingly and obediently goes, not knowing that he's being tested. And notice what he calls it all. The lad and I will go over there. And we're going to worship. We're getting ready to bow down. We're getting ready to surrender. We're getting ready to show God how worthy he is. Why? Because that's what worship is. Abraham probably loved this boy more than anything else in the world. What do you love so much? Would you give it to God? 
And I suppose that there have been things in your life, even now, because you are a worshiper, that you have given up as an act of worship because of who God is. If you're sitting here this morning, I'm sure it's not because you felt like getting up early this morning (laughs) and giving up your day to come into the house of the Lord, to gather on the Lord's day. But you're a worshiper. He demonstrated through his obedient sacrifice that to him, God was still more worthy. He loved this boy, but God was more worthy. That, my brothers and sisters, is worship. When our lives are bowed prostrate before God in such a way that nothing, no one is more Important would keep us from doing what he's asked us to do, would keep us from going in his direction. Nothing is more important to us than him. That's being a worshiper. And day after day, we're laying stuff aside, moving stuff aside, making decisions where we're constantly exemplifying that God is worth all that I do for him. Because we're worshipers. That's who we are. We worship him. We know in verse 9 through 12, just before Abraham gets ready to sacrifice Isaac on the altar, God stops Abraham. He says, "Don't, don't stretch out your hand against the lad and do not do anything to him for now I know that you fear, that you revere, and that you respect me. Now I know how much I'm worth to you. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, as worshipers, we're constantly laying our will prostrate before God so that he can have his way in our lives. We are worshipers. It's not just what we do every now and then. It's how we live our lives. Wasn't that God wanted his son? God wanted his heart. Worship is about a condition of the heart turned towards God, yielding it and surrendering it to him to lead, to show the way so that the heart may follow. God wanted not his son, he wanted his worship. Again, Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord God and him only shall you serve. I want to read the lyrics of that song one more time and see if we grab them in a different way now. When the music fades. All is stripped away. You take away the instruments, you take away the CD player, you take away the song, you take away the music. And I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth. I think the guy that wrote this song understood that the song wasn't the worship. Something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I will bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. It goes on to say in the chorus, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. 
Verse 2, king of endless worth. Endless worth. Endless worth. There's nothing that I could do. Nothing that you could ask of me that you are not more worthy of. No one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath. I worship you with more than a song. I worship you with every breath that I have. Every moment I wake and that I'm alive, every day that I get up out of bed, I will spend it living for the glory of your name because of who you are. I bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. The song is called Heart of Worship. I want to end again by saying true worship is happening before the music begins and it continues after the music stops. Will you bow your heads with me?